<laughs> Fortuna co-authored over 80 publications and received various best paper awards, uh, including 2017 ISCA uh, Influential Paper Award for groundbreaking research in power efficient uh, computing, along with the 2021 Micro Test of uh, Time Award. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Chris Feltner. Thanks a lot, Lingxia. And, and thanks a lot for uh, getting out of bed for this. Uh, I'll try to entertain you so that you don't fall asleep, but the, uh, and for all of those of you on Zoom, I would have done the same thing. So uh, <laughs> it's okay to stay in bed. Um, so uh, the topic for this is trust. And I think my angle on this will be slightly different than the other keynotes have been, which talked about very serious architecture level things. And what I'd like to talk about is, is a couple of layers above this, how we now have the building blocks to actually engineer trust into very large systems, internet scale. And, and I'd like to convince you that we should actually do this. Uh, whereas, especially if you watch the news, it seems like people have given up. Uh, but I, it's a topic that I think is really important. And I think this is kind of the next phase for what we ought to be doing to actually create a really cool you know, planet scale systems. So, but before we actually get into that part of the story, how many of you know what this is? Does anybody know this? Was anybody alive in the 90s? <laughs> so this is munition. This was export controlled. Uh, and this was actually a piece of pearl code that some of us wore on our t-shirts when we went through uh, TSA. Actually, this is before TSA existed. So this was just, you know, kind of the guy at the airport uh, who didn't know what this was either. So he didn't know that it was actually export controlled munition. And the point of this is that this is 1990, not that long ago, 25 years ago is when this was happening. And, and, and I think uh, only a few people actually remember that part of the story of uh, cryptography, how you couldn't do it. I was brand new at the time and people were experimenting. And, and this is the time when the internet developed and became an overnight success after 30 years. But the... But my point is that a lot of people have forgotten what this was. And I think in the last 20 years, we kind of rehashed a lot of this, built a much more solid foundation and, and, uh, and it's time to do it right. But the other thing that more of you might remember about the 90s, how optimistic of a time it was about the internet and how it was gonna change everything, make democracy great. And uh, you know, I, was, I was young and very optimistic. I loved it and it would it'd be nice to, kind of bring that optimism back a little bit. And I think there are some ways that we can. Now, that optimism, this exuberance about how the internet is gonna be a force for good uh, changed. And there, uh, one of the harbingers of that was uh, this article, which I remember from at the time, a professor from Columbia wrote it. And, and he said, well, will the inter internet be bad for democracy? And that was kind of a counter narrative. Everybody thought it would be great for democracy. It opens everything up. Things will be better. But this guy pointed out that um, politics will be more expensive. It'll, it'll create entry barriers. Um, it'll be harder to discuss things because political dialogue will be more fragmented. The internet disconnects as much it connects because you get into your own filter bubble, your own communities. Um, and the information does not necessarily weaken the state. By the way, in the 90s, everybody thought that, you know, the way to actually uh, um, work again, against big government is by getting online and, uh, and creating your own groups. He also pointed out electronic voting does not strengthen democracy. And uh, direct access to public officials will be phony. You can still find this article but, uh, online, but I think it's now in uh, the, uh, the Wayback Machine, the, uh, the archives. It's not on, the, on that website anymore. But it was an interesting snapshot. Now, this was the counter narrative. I actually think now this is the mainstream narrative. So uh, if you look at the general analysis about what's happening in the world, the internet has kind of turned into this negative force, especially around social media. 
But trust is really important. And it's a bad thing that the internet has undermined trust in institutions and people and all that stuff. Uh, so if you look at some stats from The Economist, basically since the internet has taken off, trust in, in politics and government has gone down. So there's something to that analysis that, that was posted 20 years ago. And on the right-hand side, it just shows you that this is not just an American thing. It, it's actually, you can track that in a lot of countries where trust has actually gone down way more than it has in the US. So there's a problem there. And for an economist, this is a problem because prosperous countries tend to be high trust countries. Trust means that people collaborate, they uh, get together, they knew cool stuff, and you don't have to overdo the, the legal and, the, and the, uh, the bribes. So trust is important. And I'd like to argue that you can actually turn the internet into something that can be a force for good, as opposed to just um, eroding trust over time. Now, so for some definitions, that, that's the, uh, the Webster definition of uh, trust, which is, well, you always have to rely on somebody. You cannot design humans and other people out. So you always have to have a degree of trust. If you're a security professional, trust is a bad thing because it means that you have to rely on somebody that you um, and perhaps can undermine the security of your system. But in a social science way, in a social way, that it is actually a positive thing. Perhaps a better definition is, is below, which is, it's a resource of social capital. And what trust is about is that you can have an expectation that the other, per, uh, the other party would behave in a certain way. So trust is also related to governance and kind of established standards of behavior around us. So now let me go back even further because for uh, those of you that were born after the Cold War was over, uh, the, the 40 years before then is not exactly living history. You've probably heard about it, but um, I just wanted to recap some of the main events in the Cold War. So first of all, this was between the Soviet Union and the, uh, and the West, uh, just for clarity. And it lasted until 1991. And then after that, there was a transition. And if you, if you look at the key dates here, you can kind of find phases in this Cold War. The, the first step was actually right after the second, uh, sorry, sorry the, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the Cold War. So the first step was immediately following World War II, there was a brief period where the US was the only nuclear power. And it actually seriously investigated whether it should just not do a first strike on the Soviet Union to just eliminate that horrible threat that communism is to the world. If you read the RAND publications, uh, the RAND Corporation publications from at the time, there was a lot of support for it. Thankfully, uh, moral standards actually prevailed and uh, it was deemed to be a bad idea. And then about 30, uh, so about 40 years of Cold War then ensued. And the next phase was all about escalation. So Soviet Union started building really big bombs and the US was uh, building even bigger ones and then vice versa. That explosion on the left, by the way, is a Soviet um, bomb apparently the biggest explosion that has ever happened. I think it was in 1961. Uh, the, so the, there was no trust and there was a period of mistrust between these parties and there was an escalation about who can blow up the other person for a while. And after, after a point, the two parties kind of accepted that the other one is not gonna go away. And in fact, it's kind of crazy to build ever bigger bombs because they can blow up the world many times over. The, so it was kind of grudging acceptance of the status quo, which was, you know, two blocks of uh, societies and, you know, they kind of have to accept each other over time. Now, the interesting thing, the reason why I bring this up is this is actually an example of how you can build trust between two societies. It's kind of a weird way of doing it, but... Uh, Actually, what ends up happening, and that's kind of what happened in that, uh, eventually you understand the thinking of the other party um, and, and you come up with institutions, you come up with all sorts of targets that uh, engagement, you iterate a lot. And while you don't like necess uh, necessarily like the other person, you, uh, you learn to live with them and build trust and cooperate even in, in certain areas. 
So that's a brief history of the Cold War. And then what happened after that is, it's called the Golden Arches, uh, well, capitalist peace theory. So, uh, you know, the, the Eastern Bloc collapsed and suddenly all these communist countries became much more capitalistic. And in fact, McDonald's was the, uh, the uh, kind of the poster child for that era. Uh, that picture in 1988, I was there. I was in that line that you see in front of it, trying to get into the first McDonald's in Budapest. You know, it was a huge thing. People from the countryside coming up to uh, capital. Same thing happened in Moscow a, a couple of years later. But, and that was kind of the beginning of the 90s. A lot of positive energy. People thought the world has changed. If you read, you know, uh, books from that era, um, they definitely reflected that world worldview that things are different now and they'll be better. And this kind of golden arches theory that no two countries that both have a McDonald's have ever fought a war, I think is mostly true. I don't know if it's completely true, but even in their blips in it when they may have fought a war, but like, for example, what's happening in Ukraine now, and, uh, you know, it, it only took two months when they were actually fighting because now McDonald's actually got out of uh, Russia. So, you know, it's a statement that's mostly true. And actually a lot of politicians and societies thought that this will be the way that we can maintain good relations, which is we engage commercially and, and build a future together. So a lot of these ideas take a long time to kind of pan out. 40 years plus for Cold War and at least 20, 30 years for the Golden Arches piece. And if you kind of go back closer to home on the technology side, uh, in the late 90s, there was a statement from uh, Scott McNeely, which was, uh, get over it, privacy is dead, you shouldn't give a shit about it, basically. And, and I think he was right, actually. A lot of people had lower expectations on privacy than anybody, anybody would have guessed. And by the way, we did not have the technology at this time to be able to deliver it very well. So it was in everybody's interest to say that privacy is kind of there, but doesn't work very well. So let's just get over it and and develop business models that don't uh, respect privacy very much. And then, which brought us to Facebook, who, who was uh, pursuing that model. By the way, they're not the only one. This was a generally accepted standard that privacy is over, get over it. And then it wasn't until a few years ago that suddenly things changed in Facebook because uh, it's becoming obvious what the downsides of no privacy are and what are the big problems that that can actually create. But if you look at the dates, it's a 20 year period in which these ideas evolve. So the fact we go from no privacy and we shouldn't have any expectation of it to companies course correcting and changing their mind and suddenly becoming more serious about uh, respecting privacy or creating environments in which privacy can be had. So these foundational ideas take a long time to play out. The other thing that happened during that 20 years is the emergence of crypto. And I just briefly want to touch on that because I think this actually colors a lot of the converse conversation around trust and privacy. The, I mean, this is a really reductionist view of what Bitcoin is, obviously, but I think the key, the key aspect of it is that it is business model as code. So you have a way of actually coming up with a system that uh, creates digital scarcity and you don't need a central centralized uh, entity to run it. And the big innovation there was uh, the proof of work algorithm, which allowed decentralization to a much higher degree than people attempted before. It's a neat idea, which is you know, crypto puzzles. And then you solve a crypto puzzle that is harder to, uh, harder to solve than to prove that it, it was solved and use that to build large systems. Now, very crucially, the whole thought process behind Bitcoin re uh, reflects a zero-sum worldview. It's, it's kind of like the Cold War, you know, the, if they win, I lose, so I, I shouldn't let them. And, and it kind of assumes that uh, they, are, they are winners and they are losers. It is about extreme paranoia, trust no one, Everyone who's involved is a potential enemy. That would be my summary, kind of, if you were to psychoanalyze Bitcoin, that, that's kind of the, uh, the, the stated objectives there. Now, after Bitcoin came Ethereum, and the innovation there was that they observed that, well, it's not just one business model that you can do, but you can do any business model as long as you implement it with smart contracts. The 
they're still in, they still haven't transitioned to proof of state, but it's another way of actually uh, creating incentives that the network will stay up. Uh, but apparently they're doing it in the fall. And the idea there was that instead of proof of work, which is actually kind of hard and uh, to do at scale, has lots of problems, including uh, um, energy problems and also throughput problems. The idea there is that why, why don't we actually move what we, uh, how we trust a transaction from the proof of work algorithm to uh, people that actually own uh, tokens and are willing to stake it and, kinda, uh, and whose, whose incentives are aligned with the future of, the, uh, of that network. So I think these are all very, very interesting ideas. And if you've been tracking the prices of these coins, you know, they go up and down a lot, almost as much as the stock market. And uh, sometimes much more, sometimes much less. But these are kind of ideas that the community has played with for the last 15 years. So I mentioned the, uh, the analogy with the, uh, the Cold War. I think proof of work is very much a Cold War style, style thought process, which is mutual, mutual assured destruction. We assume that the older parties are potential enemies and, and uh, they can actually subvert the system. Proof of stake, on the other hand, is a little bit more like the capitalist peace theory, which is, well, let's just align incentives to make sure that these networks actually stay up. And let's try to select for likely good behavior. So the people that participate now have the incentive to behave well, and then you come up with governance policies that actually try to maintain that. But I think there is actually a next phase to this, and I would characterize it as Chick-fil-A uh, piece, uh, where you really become serious about the governance. Now, how many of you actually know about Chick-fil-A? I suspect if you're not American, you probably don't, but if you, okay, you guys know, it's a, it's a quirky place. They have, it's like McDonald's, except they have really good chicken sandwiches. And, <clears throat> and the, the person whose company it is is a Southern Baptist, who's very serious about uh, uh, religion. So they have all sorts of policies. Like for example, Chick-fil-A is not open on Sundays because, because and he, deemed, uh, you know, he deemed that to be the right thing to do. They also run into lots of problems with uh, uh, certain groups because they, they, have, they fund organizations that might not like gay rights and things like that. So it's a complicated company, but it certainly has its own way of governance. It does not just do what the market says. They made up their own rules and, and they've created something that's actually pretty successful. Um, and you always see lines like this around the Chick-fil-A, I mean, often multiple, these, are, these cars are trying to get into the drive-through, by the way, and you see, you see this all over the place. So they're doing something right from a consumer point of view, at the same time, they have very strong governance ideas and they're kind of succeeding. But I think my analogy with Chick-fil-A is, I mean, it's kind of a tongue in cheek one because I think one of the other issues that we need to think about is bad analogies, analogies uh, in this world. And I think another one that is a kind of an influential analogy is uh, that has impacted crypto a lot is actually the Byzantine general, uh, general's problem. And I think this is a bad analogy is because we don't really know what a Byzantine general thought. It's like, it's not an analogy I relate to. And Chick-fil-A is not an analogy that most of you relate to unless you've been there and you kind of studied the company uh, somewhat. And I think bad analogies or incorrect analogies or subtly incorrect analogies can have uh, uh, problems long-term. And, and my problem with this paper, and well, it's not with the paper, it's just with the analogy actually, is that it is very narrow. It focuses, it creates analogy for a problem that may not actually exist in real life outside of a very narrow definition in technology. But yet what ends up happening is that people take a piece of technology and they start amplifying it to social phenomena and think that the world works like that. I try to illustrate what I mean. It may be a little confused at the moment, but my, my point is this, what happens after the battle? Let's assume, uh, by the way, I'm sure you guys know the Byzantine general's problem or at least most of you. The idea here is that you're trying to collaborate with people and some of them might be traitors. So you're like trying to go into war and some of your generals might turn against you and, uh, and uh, so, you know, and defeat their own army basically. 
But I think what we ought to ask is what happens after the battle? So why did, why did the general that became a traitor become a traitor? Did the king actually notice that some of these generals were against him? And what's the next move? So, okay, it's, it's one thing that now you're a traitor, but what do you do after that? Do you now go and kill the king because the, otherwise the king is going to kill you? Or what is the balance of power? And I guess what I'm trying to get you to consider here is that there's always a next move. The world doesn't just end in a single transaction. There's a transaction after the transaction. And what happens to the participants that were actually involved in being traitors? So I think that world model that is reflected by the Byzantine general problems, if you interpret it too, too broadly, it actually gets you into a very um, kind of screwed up situation. It just does not reflect the concerns that are in the world around you. So what's the next move? Do you really only have one shot like Eminem said? And then your shot, uh, or is it actually a system that repeats? So is this a repeated game? Is it a one-off game? And I think many te technology ideas that we love to research kind of fall into this category. If you apply it to circuits and, and, and you apply it to failure modes on an, air, uh, you know, on, on, on an Airbus, these make sense, but they don't make sense if you're actually trying to apply these ideas to social networks for example, crypto. And I think that's, that's the, uh, one of the points I'd like you to understand. But I think there are also many other ideas that people think about and they also, uh, that, that are misleading. And, and one recent example from a few years ago is, is this. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this about self-driving cars, that how, how, is it gonna, how is the AI gonna choose between bigger and lesser, um, less worse outcomes and how are we going to trust the car to be able to do that and uh, they were i mean this is 2018 this article so now we figured out that cars aren't self-driving as well as we thought that they, they we thought that they would at the time but in my opinion this is actually a completely irrelevant problem you should not design a car that ever wants to make that type of a decision. You should actually create in the failure mode, create the failure modes that it does not have to think about that problem. Yet a lot of energy is actually in the communities is, you know, is spent discussing this irrelevant problem. And I think crypto and some of the other um, things related to it are in that mode. They just focus on the wrong problem. So let's correct that. And I have a few suggestions on what might be the better problems to think about. But here's another example from, again, the 90s, because I still remember the 90s. And um, this is a very influential uh, book that Andy Grove, the uh, CEO of Intel, wrote, um, Only the Paranoid Survive. And, you know, Intel was incredible at the time. They executed for a decade. They had the best processors, amazing teams and, and everything. But... This way of thinking about the problem and thinking that paranoia is actually a good thing is, uh, you know, it, it actually has a long-term impact. And I just wanted to point out that it is a mental disorder and <laughs> suspicion of others, especially paranoia about friends and partners is a big issue. And, and if you kind of look at Intel, that has actually been the biggest struggle. Creating a foundry business is all about partnerships. It's all about balancing your own interests with your ecosystem. Uh, you know, that's one thing I learned in ARM, which was a very ecosystem or in the company, just the thought processes and the, the rules of thumb when you deal with uh, lots of customers is quite different than if you, if, you, if you think about just your own single product. And I think fundamentally, the fact that they executed so well in the 90s with that mindset, they managed to put an imprint on their execution for decades after that, simply because it's very difficult to switch out of these mindsets. If you can psychoanalyze companies, they kind of drift with their culture for a long time. And I think that's, that's a, just an observation. So back to crypto a little bit. Um, so if crypto is the answer, then what was the problem? And this is just my analysis. It could be completely off the uh, off the mark, but I, I wanted to kind of summarize the way I see the crypto world. There's a lot of techies in it, very well-intentioned, 
and some of these um, people were actually burnt by the 90s. On the, on the right hand side is a book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. This was a very influential book kind of justifying the open source movement. Oh, by the way, open source really happened, uh, uh, became mainstream in the 90s. And uh, that's one of the Bibles of that, uh, of that era. And a lot of the people that were part of that believe that technology can fix problems. And, and I think they still believe that. And in many ways, the, a large chunk of the crypto world is trying to do things better and using technology to, to actually get there. Now, there's another part of it, which is libertarian freedom. And that's the other group that actually just does not like um, government. Uh, it believes in the individual. I thought this term ethical egoism is, is kind of an interesting one, but that sums up uh, Ayn Rand's uh, worldview pretty well. Uh, rational selfishness. If, if you talk to uh, finance people, a lot of these type of principles are are often ingrained in their thinking. You know, they don't like government control because they associated that with dictatorship um, and they prize individual ability and intelligence. And I think a lot of us get some of these points, but you know, when you take these to the extreme, it, it, it can have interesting implications like reduce cooperation and, and, and get stuck in markets that are pretty dysfunctional. And then the third, Part of the crypto is, I would call them uh, people that actually view the, the role of a developer as in, in terms of a Marx, Marxist class struggle. The, it's kind of an odd worldview, but I think it has to do with some, uh, uh, a little bit with the experience of the open source movement, which started off as a very, um, very interesting new movement. People put a lot of hope in it, and then uh, quite a few people got disillusioned because it turns out the business models around open source don't work as well as people would have thought. So a phrase that you've heard, you can still hear a lot, is the tragedy of the commons, meaning that the people that actually create these projects uh, don't get compensated or they, don't have, they lose control of the projects as large companies take them over. So uh, a cartoon on the, on the right-hand side is a about a modern digital infrastructure, you know, all sorts of big components. And there's that little thing that's actually key to success that's done, done by a single guy on an open source, uh, you know, on an open source project. He never, barely ever gets paid for it. And yet large companies rely on their stuff. So lots of different sets of people with lots of different types of beliefs, but they have a common ground. So when you actually go to a crypto conference, the, the more techie side of the crypto, you, you run into all three types of people. And, and they can collaborate, by the way, pretty well. And because there's enough al alignment between their objectives that they, they start creating interesting stuff. I, uh, and by the way, I actually empathize with a lot of their views, but... I'd like to just kind of explain to you why some of these problems that they're trying to solve are hard to solve. And in fact, uh, they're kind of fundamental properties of the, uh, the ecosystem. And to illustrate that, I wanted to show you just an, a very, very simplified way of how do you actually trust any corporation? And Apple is a great example because you know they kind of came back from the dead in the late 90s and then they had an incredible couple of decades of executing and um, and this is where they started. They had this one product that was now attractive in 2001, and they had a very simple business model around it, which is you, you, you paid for it and you got it, and that's it. And everything else, you could rip off yourself. So you could take the CDs, create your own content, and they suddenly gave you a reason to use a PC. Then in 2002, they had the iPod. So now all the songs that you ripped, you could put in your pocket and listen to it, and you still only paid for hardware. 2003, they figured, well, they probably figured this out earlier, but they actually cut the deals. So now you did not have to rip the content yourself. You could buy it on the iTunes store. But the business model was still very well aligned with the consumer. You paid for the hardware, and now you, you can pay for the content that you get off the, off the store. Now, it started to get a little bit more complicated in 2005, because this is when they cut a deal with Google to become the default search engine. And the only reason why we found out about this is because of court documents later on. So we, nobody's quite sure about the terms on, on, 
uh, unless you're, I guess some people in Apple know and in Google know, but it's not public information, but we know that the deal was in place. The reason why this is complicated is because suddenly Apple has a different incentive. It's not just to do the best product for the consumer, but also how they actually maximize the value of that contract with Google. And those can be opposed. And I think those are often the type of multiple business models when they are in conflict is what creates complications uh, from an ecosystem point of view. Now, that situation actually got more complicated in 2007 because they actually cut deals with carriers as well. So now Apple got a revenue stream from AT&T, it got from Google, and it was selling product towards consumer consumers. But they still managed to manage it. And I think compared to a lot of other companies, they, they still primarily face a uh, consumer facing and the, and the revenue fly, uh, you know, flows directly. And in 2008, the app, the app store was uh, introduced. For a while, that was probably the most useful app that you could get out of the app store. Uh, but you know that changed since. It was the foundation for it. And again, the, uh, that was directly linked to the consumer as opposed to a third party. And then as you went forward um, with iCloud, again, they started to add, add in consumer facing business model. And, in, and, and I believe they actually managed to get rid of the, uh, the revenue stream from the carriers. So if you look at Apple, on balance, their revenue streams and their business models are primarily focused on the end user, which kind of align incentives. You understand what Apple is doing and, and they understand what the consumer needs and, um, and, and you can actually create a, 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 a corporation that you can, trust more or less. You may not like everything they do, but the incentives are bro broadly aligned. Now, I think that used to be the case with Amazon, but if you've been on Amazon recently, you will have noticed how many ads they actually put on the page. And the problem with that is, is that if you create a revenue stream that, that sells ads in the same, on the same page where I'm actually trying to find the best fit um, product, you suddenly don't have an incentive to make it easy for me to find the thing I'm looking for. You have an incentive to sell ads, but not for me to actually find content. And by the way, they, they created a, an incredible business out of selling ads. Um, I'm not sure if you knew this, but uh, the amount of money they make for an advertisement in Amazon is, the, is, is, is equal to the total print ad uh, revenue in the US. So, and they did this in a few years. You can see the, the chart on the right. So when you go to Amazon, you're not, your relationship is much more complicated now because you're actually the product. You going there is the thing they sell to their advertisers. And, and actually to make more money, you start confusing, you know, how, you know, how easy it is to actually find stuff on the, uh, on the site. So I think this is where things get complicated because now how do you trust that corporation? You don't know what your role is, you're being sold and you know, it kind of undermines some of the relationship things long-term. Now, this is something that actually has been observed a long time ago. So this is just a page from the paper on the, uh, the Neumann and Morgan, uh, Morgenstern wrote about the theory of games and economic behavior, 1947. And they spent a lot of time talking about this issue. And obviously not about Amazon, but the, the fact that you cannot optimize for multiple variables simultaneously. Because if, if people want multiple maxima, they actually want it at the same time. And they don't care, they cannot control all the variables. And what I care about is not the same variable that you care about. You cannot have a maximum. And so this means that business models are never optimal for all sides. And if you have multiple business models, uh, that's even, it's even, you know, it, you can guarantee that uh, it won't be. So we have to learn with disappointment, but this is not something that the crypto crowd has really internalized. The, and, and what you see in crypto land is something like this. So there are two different tokens here. On the left, TC is the consumer token and on the right is the service token. A crypto network actually creates incentives by uh, uh, creating a token, TS, and that's the thing that incentivizes the delivery of the network. So these are the miners, and 
you know, they hope that the, uh, this token will appreciate so that they make a lot of money on it. Um, and, and that hope in the future incentivizes that more miners actually get into the network and they deploy uh, mining capacity on the crypto network. On the left is the consumer uh, or the, the customer of that network that actually wants to get some functionality to work. Let's, for example, let's, let's say it's payment. You'd like to actually have a, uh, another, uh, a fixed price that, uh, or a stable price at least for the service that the crypto network is providing. And often if you actually read about crypto uh, networks, they, they separate these two, they're two different coins, but they're all, always at some stage linked to a market in the middle. But the problem is that these two things are in conflict. You cannot have a, a token that actually appreciates for some people and does not appreciate for the other side they're always going to be linked you can try to uh, engineer this but fundamentally there's a conflict of interest you can't be stable and you cannot appreciate on the same time um, and 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 fundamentally for some reason this is this is uh, something a lot of these cryptos talk about and at the same time i don't think you can ever reconcile and i think that paper from neumann actually showed a very simple proof of that now it actually gets worse because what the crypto world is actually shooting for is not just a couple of tokens, but lots of them. Because in many ways, the hope of crypto is that you can actually stand behind, uh, you stand up a component, have your own token associated with it, and that other people can compose systems with multiple different uh, components in it. And, and yes, you might be able to do this, but it also means now that you're going to have to become a treasurer and manage the the cost of these tokens. So if you know that you're going to need three different crypto networks to perform a task and you'd like to compose a service out of this, then suddenly you're going to have to become good at finance and actually you're going to have to know how much of what you'll need when. And that is a hard problem. And I would argue that nobody's even solved it for AWS. So if you're running a service on AWS, a big issue with cost management is that you have to know how much you'll need. You need to hedge your future utilization and have a good understanding of it. Um, and most companies, probably a number one priority for, uh, number one priority for large uh, enterprises is actually cost management and just knowing how many resources you need. And crypto fundamentally complicates this a huge amount. Um, so it makes something that was already impossible even, even harder. So if, you, if your dream was that you'd like to be able to make your software component sticky by associating it with a token, you're gonna have to solve this, uh, this, uh -oh. this problem, which is how do you then actually associate your product with a token and how do you make it easy for people to kind of remix it, use it as one of many tokens and still make the problem tractable. Okay, so it's kind of the introduction. The, but the fundamental question is, in my mind, well, should we create the next version of the internet to be a dystopian version of Web 2.0, the current standard? Or do we really wanna, or isn't, isn't this an opportunity to actually create the internet right again, like people a long time ago intended, but found it very difficult to deliver? Are the zero sum, low trust assumptions the right ones? Do we really want to amplify the, uh, uh, the paranoia that's inherent in the kind of at the, at the, at, at, the, the, uh, in, at the detail level into the network? And do we really need to create markets for everything? Why, why do we need all these markets to interconnect prices? Why, why can't we just price them right uh, in the first place? Um, and how do we actually create communities that are high, high trust and not full of mistrust to begin with? And I'm not sure why I phrase these as questions because I think that we should create those things. So yes, we should create things, places that are high trust and, uh, and we don't need a market for everything. And, and the reason why I put that quote there is, but to be able to do that, you kind of have to go into battle with a, with a, you know, with a good idea, with a goal that you'd like to reach. You don't just kind of get there by, by doing things in an incremental way. 
So So the fundamental problem, I think, is that in the 90s, when the internet emerged, this was a cartoon that kind of captured the essence of the internet. Uh, I'm sure many of you remember this, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And that was kind of a good thing at the time, because that meant that I did not have to, you know, I could be a dog if I wanted to be. And the, uh, uh, but, but it also just pointed out that nobody actually knew you on the internet, and you could pretend to be who, whoever you wanted. And it, over 20 five years it led us to something you know that uh, that great title which is the age of surveillance capitalism which in many ways actually fills in the gap of not knowing who everybody is so now you have to come up with sophisticated technology to kind of start being able to trust who people are or have information about them that might be useful for something but i think it's fundamental you can actually see the surveillance capitalist part of this equation as filling in the gap that was not provided um, with the technology foundation um, now, about 10, 12 years ago, this is a project that we were working on in ARM. Uh, we uh, related to um, virtual trust, we called it, but the idea was simple. This was a research project. I don't think we ever published anything about it, but it drove a lot of the uh, development effort around low power electronics, security technology at, at the building block level. And we had a very simple vision, which was we wanted a personal device like that watch that you could wear and trust very well to be the repository of all your digital ID and online and offline identities. And you know this, uh, this was the vision. There were a lot of missing pieces in this, like the crypto part, because we had some of the crypto and uh, some of it, but we did not have the end-to-end -end crypto protocols at the time. But we did spend a lot of time designing that watch and and making it uh, secure enough and low power enough to be able to hold your, uh, uh, so, so you could actually trust the watch itself to, to hold your identity information. By the way, that watch, uh, more than a decade ago, uh, it could last about a month already on a battery. So you can build these things low power, you can build them secure, and it had uh, three radios in it that were on most of the time. But the vision was this. Now, today, it's not your watch that stores this information, it's your phone or your computer, but you can see the conceptual uh, similarity. We spent a lot of time actually figuring out how you can use the watch as a peer-to-peer -peer device to, to transfer the keys to each other and, and build, build all sorts of protocols to actually be able to do that. Uh, but the, this was a technology demonstrator. This wasn't the, uh, the, the end result. We did get a couple of very interesting patents on authentication around this at the time, but that was probably the most useful part of the, the project. Aside from the electronics and understanding how you build ultra low power systems for these type of use cases. Now, the good news is that in the last decade, a lot has happened. And actually a lot of that came out of this whole exuberance about crypto. And, and every time you kind of look at these large groups of people with lots of different ideas there's always something interesting that comes out of it and and to me this is probably the most interesting part that has come out of crypto which is self-sovereign identity um, decentralized identifiers and uh, and verifiable credentials now these are actually standards now in the uh, the World Wide web consortium and and very interesting ideas that initially started as ideas that were on the uh, on the ledger the crypto ledger, but actually since then have been divorced from it and you can implement them in lots of different ways. But the key idea is this, instead of somebody else owning your identity, you should be in, co in control of your identity. Kind of like you're in control of your wallet and you have your identity papers in your wallet and so on. Um, and then they extended that idea that you can, you can then co uh, also control the identities of things that you own or your kids while they're under 18 and so on. And you, can act, you get to choose which identity you use for which purpose. So I put those colorful hats to represent which hat I'm wearing. So I might have my you know, Cisco hat on, I might have my Michigan hat on, and you know, Cisco and Michigan don't need to, you know, they don't necessarily have to know that I'm the same person, but I just have an identity relationship with each of them. But the third part of this is actually the verifiable credential part of the story which is a standard way of actually issuing credentials against these identities. So there's a potential here that you can, you can get third parties like governments or 
kind of like equivalents of uh, uh, equivalents of ISPs to issue credentials around your identities so that you can prove certain properties. And they've architected this with a way in a way that it's privacy preserving to a large degree, not 100% yet, but but it is much better than a lot of the system that we've built so far. But let me just show you how that works and why this is actually useful. So a few years ago, I came across a book which I, I wish I'd come across earlier. Uh, this was written in 1984. And, and it was a, the whole point of the book was how do biological systems actually evolve towards cooperation? And they tried to understand uh, the game theoretical models of it. The, and those are actually some very simple rules there. I think if you've, if you've done a little bit of game theory, these are not gonna be news to you because uh, they, you know, there's a tit for tat strategy that it's a very good strategy to evolve co or cooperation in a uh, repeated, uh, repeated prisoner's dilemma game. And, the, and uh, the, there are four rules to it, which is don't be envious, don't be the first to defect, reciprocate both cooperation and defection, and don't be too clever. So the fourth one, it just says that, well, there are lots of other algorithms for punishing people and incentivizing them, but if you're too clever, usually they don't do as well in, in large trials. And I think part of the reason they don't do very well is because everybody has to understand the rules and not everybody understands them to the same, same detail. And I've had some firsthand experience in a leadership uh, uh, back many years ago, they took us out and uh, we had some leadership exercises. And it, it was very interesting because they made us play a, a variant of this game. And the interesting thing was, well, I understood how this game works because I, you know, I took game theory at some point. <laughs> the other, other team didn't. And it was really interesting to watch uh, what happened because you know it was a variant of a repeated prisoner's dilemma game where the two teams could actually talk to each other but there were only 10 rounds in it and if there are only 10 rounds in it you know the last round and you know when to defect and screw them over bit right before the last round so if you're a rational person you would expect them to do the same thing as well so therefore you would actually defect at the same time and the outcome would be okay except that they had no clue about this they never thought about it and we played this game for about an hour, and then there was a four or five hour kind of therapy session afterwards. <laughs> Did you do this to me? And I, people were crying. I mean, it was actually a great event because you learned a lot about human psychology, but it was not expected for me, you know, with my, you know, block head and uh, kind of thinking through the rules on that stuff. Uh, uh, it's, it, but, it's, it, but this book actually provides a really great framework for actually thinking about how you can use these very simple rules to actually evolve in a direction that people build trust. And to me, that was the most interesting part of the book, by the way, is, is they actually get into this idea of how do you actually promote co cooperation? And then, you know, they have a bunch of rules, but I would like to just emphasize one of the rules here. By the way, number one, I think is really important. And also the key one is number five. And what they say, is that in biological systems, the fact that you can actually kind of identify the players opens up the opportunity for cooperation because suddenly now you can actually incentivize them and punish them. And if you, don't, if you cannot recognize them, you cannot actually evolve towards cooperation. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of a key insight in there that, um, uh, that is very obvious on one level, but at the same time, we just don't, think about it that much. I mean, today, if you, if you go to a website, you can just sign up, you know, you just make up an email. So you, you, your behavior, it doesn't matter because uh, you just create a new account and you move on if you're, you know, if you're, if you're a troll. So, but if you actually had a degree of identity that you can rely on, you can suddenly nudge people in the right direction, even in, in a, corporate, a cooperative way. Um, so I think, that's, a, that's, that's one interesting insight, I think, which we could actually apply to designing these systems around self-sovereign identities and so on. So the way that self-sovereign identities work is that, as I mentioned earlier, you can have a bunch of your hats, your devices, and, you, and identities associated with you. And it would look like this. Um, my key was uh, issued against the, uh, the green identity and then with a bunch of other credentials 
issued against my yellow hat identity. And, and I own the birth certificate for one of my kids and various other things about devices. And then if I talk to this red character over there, let's say it's a, it's a service, a web service of some sort, and they ask for some of my identities, I can present my credentials. Now, in this case, I presented lots of credentials, you know, a, a driver's license or a passport. And that, that means that I actually reveal my identity. So my, ye my yellow hat identity is now known to that red person, the service. And if I were to then reveal the key, they would also know me as the green hat guy as well. So in this base scenario, there's a problem with privacy because suddenly every time I show these credentials, they can learn some new identifying information about me. But you can design this system in a way that actually these credentials are not issued uh, against the specific identities, but against a set of identities. And then you can actually reduce the privacy footprint. You can also create new identities. So in this case, I made up an orange hat for this service. And then in this interaction, I could just pre uh, present the cr uh, credentials that they ask for without having to reveal some of the other identity information that I that I actually own. And then once we actually set up that relationship, you know, it, uh, uh, is, sorry, then, then we can use the, the, the orange hat to then refer to that relationship. Now, with verifiable credentials, you can actually do one better because I, show, I showed a passport and an ID that was being transferred. But in many cases, that's actually too much information. Why should they know all the information about me from my ID? They might just care about the fact that I'm over 18, 21. But I think what they, we should really create is a new credential that is a universally unique credential that, that says very little about you, except that there's a system behind it that proves that I am I am an anonymous Chris Flautner. So if in the future I present it, I can be traced back to my identity, but does not reveal my name, for example. And then you could, for example, go to Twitter, create this new identity, and you get a unique Twitter ID, and you would get that same Twitter ID even if you resigned or use a different email address to go back to Twitter, so that now my behavior would be much more accountable than it is today. And Verifiable credentials actually open up the opportunity to engineer and architect systems like this around trust that have very different privacy characteristics than what we are used to before. We are used to this all or nothing type of privacy, which is you either know everything about me or you don't know anything about me. And I think there are lots of middle grounds now that opens up with uh, uh, cryptography. So I think this is the foundation we ought to build. And it should be for privacy and accountability. I think the key properties of that is that we should all be able to wear lots of different hats. Those hats should not be easily connected to each other. In fact, they should not be connected to each other. And so that means that verifiable credentials should be transitive between all the identities that I own. And the credentials should never reveal an identifier that can be linked to me. Um, I call this thing oopsie but it's, I know it's a horrible acronym, but uh, it kind of captures the main properties, which is, you know, it needs to be universally unique, private and persistent. So that if I uh, get a new account on Twitter or wherever else, I can still be reassociated. Um, so it should prove that I'm a unique individual, but the service that I register should not actually know my universal identifier. That's a very important property because otherwise everybody you interact with could be used to track you without extra permission. And of course, there are lots of other credentials that we could establish to, to, to reveal important properties for providing certain kinds of service, services. And I don't want to, uh, in, in all of these situations, governance is actually a really important part of it. You cannot do this thing kind of organize it, or organically peer to peer. You have to establish common standards and you have to get people to kind of agree what the necessary amount of disclosure is between these systems um, and you have to have opportunity for appeals if you actually start building very broad-based digital credential systems they're going to be exceptions and things are going to screw up and these credentials are for life so you might only ever want to get one in your life so you have to have a fairly sophisticated way of dealing with problems people losing it um, things to, you know uh, things actually going wrong so uh, 
I think establishing this trust commons, kind of like the creative commons did that for accepted standards for uh, um, illegal standards around uh, open source stuff, you know, you can do that uh, for trust as well. Now, I talked a lot about privacy here. And I think it's really important to note that actually privacy is a very, uh, is necessary to actually create a system that you can trust. And, and the two are linked concepts. There's a great book that you can read that actually tries to bring update the, uh, the trust models and the privacy models into the information age. It's a, it, you know, the, the book concerns itself with a lot of legal precedents and how it's been interpreted. And it actually offers some very good ways forward to how we can actually think about privacy and trust differently and uh, to lay this foundation. So just to show you how this would work, you would get a bunch of credential providers that, that give credentials to you. And then there are a bunch of other services that you can ac access with identities. Those identities should be on a per uh, service basis, or most of the time they should be on a per ser service basis. And then the credentials that you reuse should be derived from the main ones that were provided, but should not reveal extra information to, to anyone else. And by the way, the credential providers should not have any extra information to track you through those other bases. So the, the main point here is that this foundation needs to be in place in order to create the kind of the a privacy standards that can then reveal any information that you'd like down the line. But it starts with a privacy first approach so that you can, because once you actually expose things, you can't ever go back. So I think the foundation is the, the bit that needs to be engineered to be incredibly solid. And then you can actually socially uh, create standards for what is the right amount of detail to expose to what types of services um, that you access. So if I think there are three layers at least that you, we have to think about. One of them is you have to do trust and privacy by design. Uh, you cannot just get there in a long journey. I think you have to really start with privacy to enable trust. There's a set of governance standards that need, need to exist around this so that we can all understand what are the expectations on each other, uh, on what credentials to provide or not to provide. And yes, there are always side channels. And I think this is the bit, uh, a lot of the work in privacy has actually focused on those side channels and lots of ideas there. And I think that's still very, very important except unless you solve the, the kind of the foundational problem, there's always gonna be leakage uh, on, on privacy and therefore the trust, the amount of trust that you need in the system will be very hard to achieve. And communication with a service you know, goes through all of those uh, layers. Now, some people actually talk about data being the, the number one control point. And there are lots of proposals about how people should own their data. And some of these are actually quite interesting but it isn't the problem to solve. Data ownership is complicated. And by the way, the companies that you know, have a lot of data, they don't monetize personal data nearly to the extent that people think. So this is uh, Facebook, uh, the free cash flow apparently that uh, Meta has associated with user data is about 99 cents per month per user. And it's one fourth of that in Europe. So this is, I think it's, uh, this is the, well, no, this might be the average number, sorry. So it's not a huge amount. If now somebody said that you can, you know, it's your data is worth 10 bucks, uh, you know, it's, do you really care? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a couple of coffees a year. Now, some people will say that free cash flow is the wrong metric to look at, but even if you look at other metrics, it's not, you know, it, it might be a factor of 10 higher than that number, but it's not gonna be hundreds of dollars worth. So why isn't data and personal data actually worth that much today? Um, part of, and I don't know what the answer is, it's probably all of the above. <laughs> um, you know, lots of people have the same data because people have been tracking you uh, uh, for years. So they built up pretty good databases. So you, you know, they compete on, on, on that. It's also a lot of the data about you is low quality. It hasn't been checked, it hasn't been associated. It's kind of hearsay. So if you have a data set that has lots of uh, data points in it that are incorrect, you know, it'll be not as valuable. Advertising actually doesn't value data as much as you would think. And that's, that's a whole different talk, but you, know, you need some data, but it's not all about the data. Um, 
And of course, the outcomes are really disconnected from the data source. So you're, you're in a data set, but if somebody wanted to find you and refine that data about you, it's basically imp impossible to do today. So I think that if we actually designed a, a privacy-focused trust commons, the value of the data would actually go up. And that would be a good thing because if it's valuable, we'll start managing it as a, as a resource that properly needs management. And that's... Um, and actually create new business models actually more valuable than the ones that people have built on the on the on the last privacy foundation which was nothing and just to leave you with one other interesting project this is also in the World Wide web consortium this interledger protocol i think is an example for what a new architecture could look like more broadly for things that are trust-based and privacy-based the, the, the problem they were trying to solve is how do you in how do you send value across multiple blockchains? And they went through four iterations of this protocol and eventually they created, they simplified it a lot. And they came up with something that breaks up transactions into tiny components. So if you were to transfer a hundred bucks from one crypto chain to the other, you would see a progress bar. You know, this is kind of like what you see in a movie, you know, when the bad guy is stealing the money from the bank, there's a progress bar, oh, you know, time is running out. Now this product actually works like that. Your bank today doesn't work like that. You know, there's a, uh, uh, there's a database transaction somewhere in one shot. Here, there are lots of small transactions one after the other. And part of the reason this is the design they chose was for simplicity, but also for uh, changing the tax surface. Because now this thing is not worth attacking as much, uh, you know, for a two cent transaction. If you, if you compose a hundred dollar transaction out of however many, uh, you know, 5,000 two cent transactions, then it's not worth attacking because you might be able to capture two cents, but it's unlikely to be able to capture all of the value that flew on that channel. And changing the tax surface like this has huge implications on how you can build trustable systems and how you can maintain that actually fewer attackers will be incentivized to attack it in the first place. And I wrap up because sorry, we're uh, running way over. So uh, let me just finish here. And I think that our big opportunity is to kind of look a few high, uh, layers above where we've been looking to actually re-engineer the internet with trust and privacy in mind. And I think there's a big opportunity around now because a technology around passwordless authentication is being rolled out now by the large companies. It's based on FIDO2, which is a different protocol than the one I talked about, but it's an important step forward. People are now gonna get used to using wallets for authentication we can start engineering the kind of the trust layer on top that actually creates a, uh, you know, a, a, a new privacy preserving and trust based world. I do think that privacy needs to be a first class design constraint. Now, 20 years ago, Trevor wrote an article, Trevor Mudge, uh, that power is a first class design constraint. I think he was absolutely right in a, uh, at the time. And I think now we have to add privacy to that because unless we design for this explicitly, it's not an emergent prop prop uh, property. It just, you really have to do it by design and it's very easy to screw up. And I think this chain holds. If we have privacy, it enables trust, it enables cooperation, which then creates more trust in the system. And that's actually the route to prosperity on a global level, but it's also the, the case on a micro level as well. And if we're designing these social system architectures, we should really worry about exceptions. You know, any undergrad in whatever the undergrad microarchitecture class can design a, a processor in a semester without exceptions. But, you know, when you do that for real in, in a company, it takes you many more time and you probably spend all of your design effort on the exception handling. Okay, not all, but 90%, 80%, you know, definitely in terms of validation. And I think the same is true in these systems. We cannot just focus on the primitives that actually enable the trust in the first place. We really have to work through the governance standards and figure out what if it goes wrong? How do you actually come back to a state that is usable? And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. We're opening up for questions. Oh, I'll wait. Uh, Mark Hill, uh, Microsoft Azure in Wisconsin, a very nice thought provoking talk for all the young people here, especially what do you think are, are there special hardware mechanisms needed to do all of this, or is it mostly protocol work on top? 
Well, uh, I, I think the, so two answers to that. I think we have a lot of great hardware mechanisms by now. And, um, and a lot of actually modern hardware has them. I mean, all of this stuff, you have to keep secret secret. So I, I think you just have to get better at it and make sure it works. Randomness obviously is the perpetual problem. You have to have great randomness sources. I think here it is actually that the high level system architecture really thinking through the protocols at a couple of layers higher than we ordinarily think about them. Um, so that's where I would start focusing. And then I think a lot of the hardware is in place. Hi, this is Socrates from Cornell University. My question is, how do you guarantee people don't just spawn new identities repeat over and over again? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. How do you guarantee that people would not just spawn new identities over and over again? Well, the idea with that credential, uh, credential that the UUPPC, the one that I put up, that's actually designed in a way that would be associated with you. It's a credential. I did not go into detail on how you actually get it, but once you get it, uh, it, it would actually be sticky to you. So, so, so you cannot actually, the idea is that the, the, the service that you go to would ask for your credential. It derives a new one that you can think of it as a one-way hash of your universal credential. And now they can use that to kind of check whether you register through other uh, email addresses and things like that. Then how do you generate a universal credential? We should check it in a problem. Uh, I, I can tell you afterwards, it's, it's, it's a bit, it's more complicated. It, so, but you're absolutely right. That's actually the interesting part of this whole problem, which is how do you get that credential? You have to go through somebody that provides it, somebody that actually checks that you are a unique person. So like a government office, but it doesn't have to be a government office. A government office, you can actually create these things uh, through various protocols with individual entities. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Fred Chong, University of Chicago. That's a really inspirational talk. I think it was great. Um, and I totally agree that I think, you know, privacy would, is an important first class design constraint. But the thing I'm trying to get my head around is, you know, power was a first class design constraint that we could, is a metric that we could more easily quantify and sort of permeate the system with it. Sort of thinking about, you know, privacy, how do you quantify that as a metric, you know, going like down to the hardware, um, you know, how, how do you, yeah, it's, it's harder to design for it, right? Well, you know, power was actually a hard thing to design for initially. And then, I mean, uh, believe it or not, I think in, in the early 2000s, we in, in our in, in ARM R&D, we actually did the first project that really tried to quantify power. And, and ARM was always a low power company, but it kind of evolved into it because it just had certain type of uh, design constraints that came from the customers. So it was low power by evolution. But once you try to be actually low power by design, uh, you know, it took us years to actually come up with the right methodologies, get all the p things characterized and everything else. And I think the same thing will have to emerge on privacy as well. But I think it starts with the foundation has to be, you have to get it as close to perfect as you can. Now, the, you will have side, side channel problems with any privacy foundation, but I think you have to kind of at least Prove, to, prove it to yourself that you can have the maximum if you choose to have the maximum. And then you can always relax constraints on top of it. Um, but yeah, th this is a hard thing. And, and, I, and I think, by the way, the side channel problem is a big problem that, that will never go away. But the architecture side of it, assuming that you don't, you know, that you actually architect the primitives out of which you can build a completely private system, I think has, has to be in place. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Quentin from Telecom Paris. Uh, how do you derive uh, identity from humans and create human as a root of identity? Whereas you, whereas there is for the moment no way and no government be setting up a system that is, that make identity not, I would say, uh, takeable or or. or or really a real identity and not some just, just paper generated. And also, how, how do you make this uh, work with GDPR that will prevent any DNA st st uh, storage, any DNA uh, data or something like that? Right. So I, I think the, the GDPR stuff is orthogonal to this because that's kind of a, um, 
the, the, the idea in self, uh, self-sovereign identity is that you can just create your own identity piece and it becomes something that you end up controlling yeah. yourself. And if you kind of use this in a way that you always create a new identity for yourself, yeah. depending on who you talk to, you would have to manage a lot of identities in your wallet, yeah. but, but it's going to be unique for each individual. The, the GDPR stuff, I think, is an overlay, but I think if you also if you had a system like this, you might just redefine how GDPR works because uh, you know GDPR kind of came out of a vacuum trying to pl- plug some holes and arguably it doesn't quite fit the problem very well. If you actually had a proper privacy foundation, you could actually redefine GDPR in a way to kind of fit the use cases better over time. Um, but I think we have to start somewhere. I think that the part that people haven't really done is really taking privacy seriously. People have done worried a lot about the side channel stuff. They've worried about compliance. I think it's time now to design these protocols that can actually really enable privacy, which then leads to trust in these systems. But from what I understand what you explain me is that you you just lose accountability because people can generate identity can generate identity as long as they are a human and decide and decide to have a different name or have different government generating other, other identity. For example, losing the, the ID repetitively to just generate new ID. New but ID. I think the key is there's the verifiable credential. So you can create new identities, but yes. verifiable credentials only come from a number of trusted sources. Yes, but these and- trusted sources cannot generate debate privacy. Yes. Have a debate privacy. Ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Thanks. So that concludes our keynote session. Let's thank the speaker again. So we're going to go into uh, session A, 5A, right?